Good morning. Uh, I know that uh, I'm not the one you're expecting. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but I remember they're visiting Abomar uh, for the celebration, the kickoff service over there. And so, uh, I just want to say sorry in advance. So, I will talk to you one day. You get, you get something close, and so uh, you guys get the privilege of hearing from me today. Uh, but um, I'm so glad that we are here. We want to welcome our guests and our visitors, those online, welcome. Uh, um, we hear that we have some guests all the way from Minnesota, and so we are so glad that you are here to worship and to celebrate uh, the risen Jesus with us this morning. And um, again, to our members, welcome. We are glad that you are here. Uh, there are a lot of empty seats, and so today, uh, if I attempt to preach at home, and so uh, uh, so if you guys are in English service, uh, there's plenty of empty seats. Feel free to come on over so that you don't have to be um, just watching the screen as well. Today we're going to do a combined service with English and Hmong service. But regardless of that, even though we are few in today, uh, few in, um, uh, there are only a few of us here, uh, the Bible says that where two or three are gathered in Jesus' name that he is with us. Amen. And so and before we uh, dive into the word of God, let's pray together. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. And God, we thank you that, God, we have this time to worship you. And God, you deserve all the glory and the worship. And God, as we gather here, God, I pray that you would just give us fresh eyes to see, to see who you are and to see who we are in you. Would you soften our hearts, God, so that we would be burdened to build your kingdom that we would seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, God, and help us to uh, do all things that are, that are going to be pleasing to you this morning. We love you, God. We pray for understanding. We pray for translation. And so, God, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Again, if uh, you guys, I'm sure that uh, I'll try to finish before then, and you guys can tune into the live stream over there. I think they are live streaming in Albemarle as well for the kickoff service. <laughs> and so, no, no, uh, I wanted to preach a, bur- uh, a message to a bit of a lawyer. You know, to a lot of people, you know, a bit of a lawyer, you know, a bit of a lawyer, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people, you know, but today I believe that there's a word that I wanted to give to our English ministry because believe it or not, um, I believe that in 10, 15 years, if our English ministry does not step up, build this church, if we don't come and help build this church, if we don't take responsibility, this is what our church is going to begin to look like more and more, believe it or not. Because believe it or not, time is coming and the baton will be passed and it is time for our generation to raise up, to stand up, to take responsibility and ownership of this church and to receive God's burden to build this church. Amen. Uh, let's be honest, right? Uh, how many of you here, uh, how many of you guys here have spent your time and your money and your resources and even spent time in prayer uh, building the kingdom of God? How much of your resources, your tithes, how much of it has been going towards the kingdom of God, uh, both in the global sense and also in the local sense here in True Life Alliance Church? I'm not just talking about your time that you've spent praying 
for true life or for God's kingdom to be built. But I'm also talking about your time and your, your money and your, your affections and your resources, right? So a good way to evaluate this is to ask yourself this. Uh, if God were to answer every one of your prayers today, would, your wor- would the world change or would just your world change? Would the world change or would just your world change if God were to answer all of the things that you have been praying for? That shows what we have been really investing our time and our resources and our hearts uh, into, right? Many times we are just focused on building our world and making our life better, and making our life more comfortable, making our life more convenient. But really, at the end of the day, um, what matters most is the kingdom of God. Amen? Senior pastor, week after week, about the kingdom of God, and how God, he comes not just to uh, give you a ticket to heaven, but he invites you into the kingdom of God that is here, that is present, that is among us, that is within us. And he says that because the kingdom of God is here, you must enter it now. And then when we die, we just simply continue in living in the kingdom of God, in the, in the fullness of the kingdom of God, in the consummation of the kingdom of God, face to face with Jesus when he returns. The kingdom of God is here and now, and that's the most important thing that we can live for. And so I wanted to talk about what that looks like. What does it look like to uh, make our life um, to seek first the kingdom of God, to make our life about building the kingdom of God, especially in the local context, about here, uh, a local context here in true life, right? And so, again, um, if you guys have your Bibles, if anyone you guys can turn with me to Nehemiah. Uh, to the book of Nehemiah chapter 1. We'll be in Nehemiah chapter 1. In the book of Nehemiah, we are actually introduced to a character, a man named Nehemiah. And I want you to notice that Nehemiah, um, uh, he's not a prophet. He wasn't a priest or he wasn't a king, right? And so that's to say that he was a very ordinary man. He was a regular Joe, right? He worked a nine-to-five job, just like many of us we do. Um, he, he just did the things that he needed to do to make a living. He was living comfortably, but although he was an ordinary man, he had an extraordinary God who gave him an extraordinary calling. And we see that Nehemiah was able to fulfill this calling as he followed God and he followed the, the, the leading of the Holy Spirit. And so this ought to encourage us because this comes, to, this comes to show us that you don't have to be a pastor or a professional, you know, like religious person. Right? You don't have to be uh, a, a church worker to actually be used by God. Uh, here at True Life, we have the saying, uh, every member is a minister, right? Uh, every member is a minister because we here believe that uh, we believe in the priesthood of all believers, We believe that God is able and willing and he wants to use not just pastors and the the religious priests and, and, you know, those who are paid and full-time ministry. He wants to use every single person here in this room for his kingdom, right? He wants to use you today, whether you're young or whether you're old, whether you're first gen or next gen, he wants to use you to build and advance his kingdom. He's able to do it. And, and, and he shows us how he's able to do it, even in the person of Nehemiah, right? And so in Nehemiah chapter 1, let's read this, read this together. In Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, it says, During the month of, of Kislev, in the twelfth year, when I was in the fortress city of Susa, Hanai, one of my brothers, arrived with men from Judah, and I questioned them about Jerusalem and the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile. And they said to me, The remnant in the province who survived the exile are in great trouble and in in, in disgrace. Jerusalem's walls have been broken down. Its gates have been burned. And so Nehemiah was actually, we see, 
<clears throat> Nehemiah, well, actually, before we even talk about what's happening here in this passage, let me just catch us up to what's been going on, right? Uh, <clears throat> for hundreds of years, Israel have actually been in captivity by the, under the Persian Empire. And so the, they've been uh, oppressed by the Persians and before the Persians by the Babylonians for hundreds of years, for generations, right? Uh, the Israelites have been in captivity. And so the nation of Israel, what happened was it was divided. And because they were divided, they were conquered by foreign powers. Um, they were enslaved. They were uh, persecuted. They were oppressed. And what happened was eventually we come to this point where Nehemiah is in, where the Persian Empire actually was the world power. And it just so happened that God put it on the heart of the Persian king, who was, you know, um, King Artaxerxes, to allow some of the Jews to return to Jerusalem. And basically, he was giving them freedom of religion, right? He gave them permission to, re to try to rebuild the temple, to try to um, uh, practice worshiping the God of Israel once again. They tried to, to, they tried to gain a good rapport. From the, Jew, from the Jews so that they wouldn't revolt and they wouldn't rebel, that they would have, you know, they would have this, like, good relationship or, or sort of a good relationship with the Persian Empire. That was sort of the mentality of the Persian Empire. Before that, the, the Babylonians, right, they would actually be very oppressive. They would, they, would, they would not be very kind to the Jews. They would actually persecute, and they would be very, um, uh, they were very barbaric in the way that they were, treating the Israelites. And so what happened was, uh, after the Persians that came, they ended up allowing the Jews to return to Jerusalem, or at least some of them. And they allowed the Jews to go back to rebuild the temple. And so what's the significance of the temple? The temple is the dwelling place of God, right? And so basically, the temple was where God met with his people. And the, the Jews, they wanted to rebuild this temple. They wanted to be with God. They wanted to have a place where they can offer sacrifices with God again. They wanted God's presence to lead them and to be with them once again. And so God called two individuals, for the one, one being um, Zerubbabel and another being Ezra, to lead two different waves of the Israelites back to Jerusalem out of, out of Persia to actually rebuild uh, Jerusalem and the, to rebuild the temple. Their hopes was that eventually God would again fill the temple and God would bless the, Israel, the nation of Israel again, and he would set them free and deliver them from their oppressors, right? And so we see that that doesn't happen as they planned because when we come to Nehemiah, they're still under oppression. They're still under the Persian uh, the, uh, captivity. And so Nehemiah, we find him to be an Israelite, uh, but he was actually a servant of King Artaxerxes, right? He was actually a cupbearer, and so he was well-known, and well-loved by, well-trusted by the, the, the Persians. Uh, he has a comfortable life in Babylon, and he served at, in the royal household of Persia. And so one day we see that in verse 1, uh, Nehemiah comes across some of his Jewish brothers who actually were exiles. They went back to Jerusalem. And so Nehemiah went and he asked them, and he, he, he was trying to catch up with them. He asked them, brother, how are things going, Right? Uh, how are things going there in Jerusalem? How are you guys doing in Jerusalem? Um, and so he hears from his brothers that Jerusalem, they, it, it, they are desolate, right? They're in a desolate place. They're in a very desperate place that they're not doing well at all, right? Basically, he was telling them that things aren't going well. Uh, Jerusalem, they have no walls. And so in a sense, what he's saying is they have no means of defending themselves. Um, back in those days, uh, they were easily uh, taken advantage of by neighboring countries and neighboring enemies, right? And so without walls, you could not defend yourselves. Without walls, you could not build a city or an army. They, you were basically helpless and, and hopeless. You had no hope of being able to be uh, established as, as a nation once again. And so uh, Nehemiah hears of this news that the people of God, they not only were there, was there not a city that was being built, um, the temple was not being built. The people of God, they were leaving, they were worshiping idols. The spiritual uh, and the moral atmosphere of that time was not good as well. The people of God, they were being put to shame. 
because they had no city, but the name of God was also being put to shame because there was no temple. There was no worshipers of the temple of God. And so they, uh, Nehemiah, when he heard this, we see in verse 4 that Nehemiah, he was greatly distressed, right? He was distraught. Nehemiah, he was grieved. He heard uh, that Jerusalem was broken, and we see that Nehemiah himself became broken. Why was Nehemiah broken over this? Because what's interesting is that Nehemiah, he was actually born uh, like a second and third generation, right, uh, into, the, the, into the, the nation of Babylon and in Persia. So Nehemiah never knew the glory days of what it meant to live in, in Israel, when God filled the temple, when, they, when Israel had, uh, was the world power, Nehemiah had no idea what that was like. Nehemiah grew up in Babylon and in Persia. He grew up in the captivity. And so he had, whether, really, whether or not Jerusalem had walls, it had nothing to do with Nehemiah, right? Whether or not Jerusalem had its own nation, Nehemiah lived comfortably. He understood the culture of the, the Persians. He understood the language of the Persians, and so he had a good relationship with the Persians. He was doing really well for himself. And so whether or not Jerusalem had walls, whether or not those people in Jerusalem, the Israelites in Jerusalem, they were well, doing well, it really had nothing to do with, with Nehemiah. But yet Nehemiah still felt like he needed to do something. He still felt like, it, it, he still felt burdened by this news, right? And so this is really interesting, again, because another reason for this is that Jerusalem had already been destroyed and desolate for, laid desolate for 141 years. It's been 141 years since Nehemiah, uh, since this point. That, uh, so it's uh, 141 years has, had already passed since Nehemiah uh, heard of this, that the, since Nehemiah uh, up to this point, right? And so... Uh, Nehemiah, he, again, he, this is not something new to Nehemiah. Uh, this is old news. Nehemiah, he grew up hearing the stories of the glory days, but he knew that ever since he was born, they've been in captivity. And so he, he's known of the temple being destroyed. He's known that Israel and Jerusalem had no walls. He's known this for some time, and he's been okay with it for some time. He's been serving the king of Persia, and he's been living comfortably for some time. Why is it that all of a sudden, when Nehemiah hears of this news, his heart gets broken, right? Why is it all of a sudden he hears of this, and he's distraught over this? I believe that it's, it's because of this. It's not that Nehemiah suddenly receives news that Jerusalem has no walls, and he's caught by surprise. Now, Nehemiah, this is old news for him, but... With this old news, God gave him new, a new perspective to see this old news with new lens, right? And so, in other words, Nehemiah was able to, because of his love for Jesus, he was able to receive new eyes, fresh eyes to see old news, old things that he couldn't see before, right? Uh, Nehemiah was able to see things that he couldn't see before. He was able to feel things that he couldn't feel before. Why? Because he had a relationship with Jesus, he knew the word of God. He, you know that he had a relationship with God because when he first heard of this, what did he do? He went and he prayed. We know that Nehemiah was a person to, to be a man after God's own heart, just as David was. Not many people were in relationship with God, but one person that we knew who was in relationship with God was Nehemiah because he was a man of prayer. He was a man who knew the word of God, and we'll come to find that more and more as we read along. Nehemiah, he was familiar with how things used to be, right? Uh, but what happened was because of Jesus giving Nehemiah a new heart, because Jesus was, I believe Jesus in this moment was giving Nehemiah fresh eyes to see his people and his glory. Nehemiah, all of a sudden, what used to fall, uh, the news that used to fall on Nehemiah's heart that was hard was now softened. The things that used to, uh, not bother Nehemiah started to bother him. The things that used to not burden him began to burden him. And so it's, it burdened him so much to where he was in ruins. He, he lost, he was uh, distressed. That means he had no joy. 
That means he, he felt like there was no light in his life. He felt like he had to do something. Nehemiah, again, he wasn't a prophet. He wasn't anointed by God to be used by God. He wasn't a priest, right? He wasn't someone who worked as a, as a, as a uh, he wasn't uh, in, in a position uh, to have any sort of influence over the Jewish people. Uh, he did have some influence, but he, was, he had influence over the Persians, right? But he did not have any influence over the Jewish nation. He was not a king to have any power over the Jews, and yet Nehemiah had a burden to build the kingdom of God. You know, I wonder, how many of you guys have had that kind of moment that Nehemiah had in this moment? Nehemiah, in this moment, he had this burden that, that was given to him, this supernatural encounter almost, where all of a sudden, the things that he used to care about, he began to care less and less about. The things that he didn't care about, he began to care about. He had this conversion experience all of a sudden, right? It was almost like his heart began to change. And that, again, his heart began to soften. Uh, he began to care about God, about his kingdom. He began to care about God and the, his righteousness he began to care about God and his people and his glory. And Nehemiah began to care less and less about his kingdom and about his, his, his conveniences and his own comfort, right? And for many of us, last week, right, when I, was, I wasn't here, I was up in Minnesota fishing at a wedding. But and the reason why we ought not to be afraid of dying is because when you have had the same encounter that the Apostle Paul has had with Jesus, all of a sudden, you realize that you've already died, right? On the road to Damascus, right? He received a new heart. All of a sudden, the things that the, uh, the apostle, uh, the Saul used to care about, he used to be zealous. He used to want to uh, please people. He, he used to want to try to persecute the Christians and do what was right in his own mind. He thought that he was doing right before God. All of a sudden, when he encountered Jesus, that, that Saul died, and the Paul that, that, uh, that remained, it's, it, he's the one that's alive now. And it, uh, the apostle Paul says in Galatians 2.20, he says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so that's the reason why we, are, we no longer have to be afraid of dying. Uh, it's like as if the things that, again, you used to care about in your marriage are suddenly start changing, right? When it comes to your marriage, before you met Jesus, it used to be about how much uh, your spouse can give you, right? How happy your spouse can make you. But when you've met Jesus, when, when Jesus has come to be your Lord and your Savior, when he's invited you into his kingdom, all of a sudden, it's no longer so much about how much my wife can make me happy, but it's how much I can make my wife happy, how much I can serve her, how much I can give to her. It's not, much about, it's not so much about how much I can receive, but it's about how much I can give because I'm receiving so much from the life of Jesus already. Amen? And so this is really what... Um, it looks like for, the, 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 for Nehemiah, right? Nehemiah, all of a sudden, the things that used to matter to him suddenly didn't matter as much. Nehemiah, he had a high position, right? He was basically, again, he was well-trusted by the Persian king. He was a cupbearer. Just like David was a cupbearer to King Saul, Nehemiah was a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. He was paid really well. He, was, he had it all, right? He, he was basically living the dream there were other Israelites who were poor. They were, you know, slaves. They were living in exile. They were um, living under persecution, but not, not, not Nehemiah. Nehemiah, he was doing really well for himself. And yet, all of a sudden, Nehemiah saw that everything he had gained, he now counts as loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, right? So, yeah, Nehemiah, Nehemiah, it's, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything because now all of a sudden Nehemiah has a heart change. He's now burdened not just to build his own kingdom. He's burdened to build the kingdom of God. The things that, uh, the people that doesn't really matter to him all of a sudden matters. 
I wonder, and I speak to you now, I know that there are many here who, who still are very consumed with just building your American dream, right? We're still set on building our careers. We're still set on students building our education. We're set on building our family, our houses. We're set on many things, but these things will not last. We know that in time, these things will all fade away, right? These things will rust. These things can be taken away from you in a blink of an eye. There is one thing that lasts, and that's the kingdom of God. There's one thing that lasts, and that's the people of the kingdom of God, right? And the invitation that God invites you to this is the same invitation that God invites Nehemiah to, is to build upon the things, to build and invest your life into things that will last an eternity, things that cannot be taken from you. And so Nehemiah, again, um, he's, he's suddenly burdened of things that he used to not be burdened of. Are you worried about our generation? I know that many of you guys are worried. You know, like, you know, like, we're, we're, there's so many of us that uh, are, are worried, right? Uh, many of our young generation, we're, we're, we're quite worried as well. We're worried about, we're worried about, you know, the fact that, you know, when, when the old generation, when the, the, this generation is, is done, what are we going to do? Or maybe we're not even that worried. We're just like, we can't wait until they're done, right? We can't wait until their time is gone and our time is here. And we're not really concerned about what they're concerned about, right? They're getting older, and they're, the things are getting more difficult for them, and yet we're so busy with our life. We're so busy and consumed with building our kingdom and, and building our American dream that we really just, again, we're hyper-focused on our own life. Many of us, that's the biggest temptation for us. It was the temptation for Nehemiah then. It is the same temptation now. We live in a world of consumerism. We live in a world where we are hyper-focused on just achieving the things that makes us happiest, right? We live in a post-Christian world where you do what you want, no matter what it takes, you, 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 you sacrifice whatever it takes to get what you want. That Whatever makes you happy, you pursue that. Anybody who stands in your way, they are an enemy. This is the kind of world that we live in because we are so focused on the self. We don't really care about the next generation after us either. We're really just focused on us and our generation and our, our really, not even our generation. We're just focused on what we have right in front of us, what we can see, our own life. I believe that today God wants to give you a burden that's, that's greater than yourself. I believe that today God wants to give you a burden that's beyond just what you have been working for, what you have been striving for. That it's not just, God doesn't just want you to uh, be debt free. God doesn't just want you to have, you know, a family with, with lots of kids who grow up to be successful. God wants you to be uh, a people who represent him well. God wants you to be a, a family where there is intergenerational, right? Where, and, and this generation, we're going to hold on the, to the hands of the youth. And the youth is going to hold on to the hands of the, the, the children. And true life is going to be a, a, a church where we are intergenerational, where we care about the next generation. We are burdened to build not just what God is doing here in our generation, but we are burdened for the generation before and the generation to come, right? This is what I believe that God is doing in our time as well. Because our, we live in a time that is not too different from, the, from Nehemiah, right? Nehemiah, during his days, during, in, in Jerusalem, the people of God, they were not very concerned of the things of God, right? Be, again, they, were, they had hundreds of years to rebuild the temple, and yet the temple was not built. They had hundreds of years to rebuild the walls, and yet nobody cared to build the wall. It wasn't until God placed it on Nehemiah's heart to build, and Nehemiah decided, I'm not going to just stand by and blame the, 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 the previous generations for not building, right? Nehemiah could have done that. Nehemiah, he could have easily be just been frustrated at the previous generation and been like, they should have, they, they were already given the freedom to go by, uh, by, the, by the Persian Empire to go and rebuild. They've had hundreds of years, and yet they didn't build, 
And so whatever, that's on them, right? They could have blamed, he could have blame shifted, and yet he didn't. Which is true. That is true too. It's a lot of times it's not it's, it's because we're not doing our part. But I wonder, are you doing your part as well? Uh, and, and, and I believe that as I look at this church, even in the English ministry, even in, this, in the youth, many of us are doing our parts, but we're not doing it collectively, and we're not doing it as a whole, right? The reality is, um, uh, God doesn't need any one of us. The reality is, he doesn't need Nehemiah at all, right? God could have done what he needed to do with or without Nehemiah, but he wants to invite Nehemiah to rebuild the walls with him. He wants Nehemiah to rebuild, essentially, the kingdom of God with him. In true life, I believe that with or without us, with or without you, God is going to continue to um, make, allow his will to be done, and his, he's going to allow his kingdom to come. Because he is for his glory, and he wants his name to be made known. But the thing is that he invites you to receive the, in the reward of building his kingdom with him. He also wants you to know that if you join him, that the work is going to be lighter, right? When we carry the burden together, the, the, the load is lighter. When we do it together, we get to do it quicker. We get to do it faster. Uh, we we, we got to stop making excuses. We got to stop blaming other people for the work not being done. And we got to start taking responsibility and ownership of what God has called us to do in this time and in our generation, right? Nehemiah, he was burdened, right? He was not just bothered, he was burdened. Many of us, we are bother, bothered by many things, right? We are bothered by the things that we see on social media. We are bothered by the way that the political uh, atmosphere is right now. We are bothered by Disney, uh, you know, subliminally, um, is like trying to push all these agendas and trying to, you know, like do all these things and we're, we're, re- we're very bothered by it, but I wonder, are you burdened? We're bothered by the way that our life is right now, but are you burdened for the things of God? We're bothered by the, the, the state of our church, right? Uh, we were bothered that it takes three years to build three small buildings, but what are you doing? Are you burdened by the things of God? Are you doing your part, right? Because here's the thing is that God and all the things that he does, he has a role for you to play. Right? He invites you to join him uh, in building his kingdom, in rebuilding the walls of his kingdom. Here's the thing is that every one of us, we have different parts of the walls to build. Your, your part may be on the worship team, right? Um, we, I'm sure that I can speak on behalf of the worship leaders, on, on behalf of Sifu Josh. Green Paul has said, but I want to encourage you here today, right, that maybe your part is to come alongside the worship team because they are stretched thin, right? Even this week, uh, we have some people leading worship here. We have some people leading worship in Albemarle. We have some people preaching in Albemarle. Perhaps your part is to join and to just offer your service. Maybe you may not be the most experienced musician or the most experienced singer, but you have a joyful noise to give, right? Maybe you're here and you know how to uh, click some buttons and you know how to hold a camera. Maybe your role uh, to build the wall is to, to join the media team. Maybe here in the local church context that I'm speaking about, maybe your role is to, to serve in children's ministry. Maybe your role to build is to build the youth ministry. Maybe your role to build is to, to join the resource center. Maybe your role to build is to build a website because we desperately need some IT guys, right? I know Sifu Jai is actually working towards finishing that. We have a few people who are, who are there to help. But if you are, uh, have any experience or you know of people who have any experience, 
God is inviting you to use your experience, use your influence, use your resources, use your skills to build his kingdom here and to advance the gospel message from being, uh, to be able to be preached here in true life and, and to all the regions of this, this nation and to the earth, right? It, it, you have a role to play. Every member is a minister. It's not enough to just be burdened, right? You have to not just be, be burdened by this. You have to actually be willing to build. You have to actually be willing to build. And so how does Nehemiah go on to build, right? If you look at verse 8, we see that Nehemiah, uh, when he, uh, or verse 4, we see that when Nehemiah hears of these things, it says he sat down, he wept, he mourned for a number of days, he began to pray and fast, right, before the Lord, the God of the heavens. And so what does Nehemiah do in order to start building? What does he do? He doesn't just start taking a hammer, and he doesn't just leave to start building. What does Nehemiah do? He goes to God, right? His first instinct is to go to God in prayer. We, a lot of times here, especially here in True Life, I hear a lot of us being hard workers, yeah. And that's a good thing because it's not enough to just talk the talk. We must walk the walk, right? We have, for too long, we have only talked about things. We have not done things. But Nehemiah noticed that he doesn't just immediately go to do and to obey God. He goes to discern and to, to sit in God's presence and to wait on God, to open up the doors for him to, so that he would be able able to build upon the things that God is calling him to build, right? And God, Nehemiah wants to do what God has called him to do, but you cannot do what God has called you to do if you're not spending time in prayer, right? We do talk a lot about working here and serving here, but we also talk a lot about praying and fasting. And that's why every year, at the beginning of the year, we invite the church, we invite all of you to join us in praying and fasting together. And we don't just invite you to pray and fast to make you a religious person, we don't just pray and fast so that God will bless us this year. We pray and fast. We invite you to join us so that you get into the habit. You develop a lifestyle of spending time with God so that you learn to listen to God. It's not, we're just, it's not just us talking to God. It's not just a monologue. When we pray, it's a dialogue where we listen to God. We, we come and we present our requests to God, but we also come and we wait on God and we listen to God, right? And in order, in order for us to pray well, we must also, as Nehemiah does, know the, the Word of God. We must also read the Word of God. We must also study the Word of God. Nehemiah, he spent time praying and fasting, but we also see that he also spent time in God's Word because we see that in verses, uh, in, the, in the following verses, Nehemiah, he prays to God. And then in verse 8, he begins to say this. He says, please remember what you have commanded your servant Moses. He begins to quote scripture, right? If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and carefully observe my commands, even though your exiles are banished from the further, to the furthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place where I chose to have my name dwell. They are your servants and your people. You redeem them by your great power and your strong hand. And so what's Nehemiah saying here? Nehemiah, he's actually reminding himself. He's not reminding God of his promises, right? He's reminding, um, God's prom he's reminding himself of who God is and what, what God has promised him. He, he's reminding himself and he's preaching to himself. And he's saying to himself, if I can get the people of God to repent and to return to worship God, God will relent. God will deliver. God will, God will rebuild. God will redeem, right? That's God's promise. That is who he is. And so Nehemiah, he is preaching to himself. And so what we see from this passage here is that in order for Nehemiah to build, Nehemiah first went to pray, to fast, to seek God, to remind himself of who God is, to remind himself that he doesn't do this alone, right? Many times we do things and we do it without prayer. And essentially what we're doing is that when we don't pray, what we're saying is that we don't need God, right? When we do things, we, when we go to evangelize, when we go to do deliverance, when we, go to, uh, when we go to teach, when we go to preach, if we're not praying, if we don't live a life of prayer, what we're doing is essentially we're trying to work from our own strength. We're trying to do things apart from God. But we know that according to what Jesus says in John 15, that apart from him, 
We can do nothing, right? Apart from God, apart from us sustaining a life of abiding with God, of staying connected to God in prayer and abiding in his word and abiding in his love, then anything we do would not bear fruit. Many of us, we've served as small group leaders. Many of us, we've served in ministries here. But I believe that the reason why maybe your, your ministry never bore fruit is because maybe you never spent time with God. You wanted to do a lot of things for God, but you didn't really want to be with God. Nehemiah, he comes to show us that before we ought to do things for God, we are invited to, do, to, to, to just be with God, right? Nehemiah was a man who, he, before he did things for God, he spent time with God. And that's why when he began to do things for God, God blessed him. That's why when he began to do things for God, he, the works of his hand bore fruit. Did you guys know that for hundreds of years, right, for hundreds of years, uh, the people of Israel, they tried to rebuild the walls. For hundreds of years, for generations, they tried to rebuild the temple. They tried to have God's glory come down and fill the temple and to lead the people of Israel once again. But they did not do it well. God did not bless them. God was not with them. Why? Because they did not seek God. But we have one man, Nehemiah, who sought God. We had one man. God just needed one person to seek him, to love him. And when he found someone to love him, to seek him before he, he loved himself, before he sought to build anything else, to do anything for God, then God was able to use him to do great things. What took hundreds and ge- hundreds of years, generations, took Nehemiah only 52 days. When, when Nehemiah finally uh, was given favor to go back to rebuild Jerusalem and to rebuild the walls, in spite of all the op- opposition, if you guys read Nehemiah, I, w- I don't have time to re-explain it here and to tell um, the whole narrative here, but Nehemiah ends up going back to Jerusalem, right? He, he gains favor from King Artaxerxes, and he goes back to Jerusalem. And he only, it only took him 52 days. What, took, what, what has, has taken hundreds of years only took 52 days for Nehemiah and a handful of people to rebuild the temple of Jerusalem and the walls all around Jerusalem. How was Nehemiah able to do this? Not because Nehemiah was a good, good craftsman. It wasn't because Nehemiah was a good leader. It wasn't because he was a king or he had any influence. It was simply because Nehemiah was someone who loved God first. It was because Nehemiah was someone who, before he sought anything else, he sought to be with God. He sought to know God. He waited on God, and when God opened up the doors for him, God blessed the work of his hand. And within a short period of time, God was able to do more through Nehemiah than he was able to do through Nehemiah's uh, parents and his grandparents and their generation and the generation before them. Amen. God is able to do infinitely more, uh, tremendously more than what you, have, you can uh, do on your own if you would just seek God and if you would just trust him, right? I think the reason, again, the reason why many of us, we aren't burdened to build the kingdom, why many of us, we are so set on our own life, why many of us, we have tried and we've burnt out, we've led small groups, we've burnt out, we've we served as deacons, we've served as elders, but we've burnt out is because many times we've been trying to do it on our own, right? Psalm 127, it says this, uh, Psalm 127, verses 1 and 2 says, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders, they build in vain. They labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. Here's what I found. Oops, Siri's talking to me. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. And this is to say many of us, I think many times, we want to do things for God, right? Green James that so do thing he not. We want to do things in, in such a way that brings God glory. We want to serve God. We want to serve God. We want to serve God. We want to be servants of God. The problem is many times, again, we don't, we don't first seek God. We do things. Uh, we want to do great things for God. But here's the thing is that if you look back in Genesis chapter 11, there were the people, the people, of, the, the people during the day, they wanted to do great things, right? 
They wanted to do mighty things, and so what did they do? They built a tower of Babel. And what did God do to that tower? He destroyed it because they wanted to be great. In the very next chapter, in Genesis chapter 12, we meet a man named Abraham. He didn't want to do great things. He didn't want to be great. He wanted to be with God. He, he loved God. And what did God do? God comes to Abraham and says, I want to make your name great. I want to make you the father of many nations. Wait, wait, wait. I thought that it wasn't a good thing to be great. Because in, 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 in Genesis, uh, Genesis 11, people try to be great and God destroyed them, right? God scattered them. God destroyed the works of their hands. No, it's not that God doesn't want you to be great. God says, if you try to make yourself great, then you have to sustain yourself. If you try to make yourself great, then you are an enemy of God, right? Your friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God. But if you allow God to make you great, if you allow God to be the one to uh, open up the doors for you, if you allow God to be the one who is your heart's desire, then he will make you great. True life, we're not going to be great if we just do it on our own strength. We're not going to be great if we, we try to do it on our own wisdom, out of our own wisdom, right? Out of our human strategy. We can't guilt treat people. We can't, we can't use reverse psychology. We can't use any human wisdom or logic to try to make the next generation great or to make true life great. The only way that we can make ourselves great is to entrust ourselves to God, to, to wait on God, to love God with all our hearts, our souls, our mind, and our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. And God will make him, his name great through us. He will make our, his name great through true life. That's the only way that we're going to be able to do anything that's going to have an eternal impact. That's the only way that we're going to be able to build as Nehemiah built. To build the kingdom of God, you must first love God. And then to build the kingdom of God, you must then, and, and out of your love for God, be compelled to obey God, right? Nehemiah, he didn't just spend time praying. We see that Nehemiah, he didn't just spend time uh, reading the Bible, reading scripture. Nehemiah, he, he, it's not enough to just come on church, to church on Sundays and to learn about God's kingdom. It's not enough to, just to be able to re quote Sifinyavaz and redraw Sifinyavaz, you know, like uh, diagram of what it means to enter into the kingdom. You have to actually live as a kingdom citizen, like what my dad always preaches, right? As what Sifinyavaz eats, you have to live as a citizen of the kingdom of God. You have to enter into the kingdom. If your, your kingdom is still about comfort and convenience, if you still only want to build when it's easy, if you only want to build when it's convenient, if you only want to serve when it's convenient, maybe you're not yet in the kingdom. You might want to ask yourself, perhaps you've only invited God into your kingdom, but you're not yet ready to build his kingdom. The invitation is to build on something, to build something that's going to have an eternal impact, to build something that's going to actually last. Nehemiah hears this call. Nehemiah receives this burden to build God's kingdom. Nehemiah doesn't just pray about it. He doesn't just learn about it. He goes and he says, I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to do my part. I don't have a position. I don't have a title. I only have influence over the Persians, but I'm going to use whatever influence I do have. I'm going to use whatever skills I have. I'm going to use whatever I can, do whatever I can to play my part so that God's city is built, so that God's people is loved and, and protected, so that God's name is, is exalted high. This is what God is inviting us to true life, right? Both for the, our generation and for Yalal that we are to simply do our, fulfill our purpose in our generation and to care about other generations, to care about God, his kingdom, his righteousness, to seek him. And then as we do that, God's going to use us to do great things for the kingdom. Nehemiah, finally, we see that Nehemiah goes. He builds. He's able to accomplish the building of the walls within 52 days. He's able to do what was deemed impossible because God was with him. Church, I wonder here today, uh, do you care about the things that God cares about? Do you, are you burdened by the things that God is burdened for? Or are you just burdened by, you know, the things that, are you just burdened by the debt that you owe? You know, are you just burdened by your school loans? Are you just burdened by, you know, like your kids? Are you just burdened by your marriage? Or are you, the things that worry you, the things that, that you're burdened by, are they the things of God? 
the invitation today is that God wants you to come to him. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says this. He says, come to me all who are, who are weary and heavy burden, and who has heavy burdens, right? Jesus says, if you're here today and you're, you're, you have a lot of burdens, he invites you to come to him, to give him your burdens. The reason why many of us are burdened by many things, the reason why many of us are tired and weary, the reason why many of us are here and you come to church week after week and you're not receiving anything, perhaps is because you are carrying things that you've never, you're not meant to carry. You're still wanting one foot into the kingdom and one foot in your kingdom, right? You want, you want, you're so lukewarm. Perhaps you're, you're still unwilling to let go of things from your kingdom. And God says, in order to receive his kingdom, you must empty your hands. In order to receive his kingdom, you must come into his kingdom. Receive him as Lord and Savior over all, everything in your life. You must come to him, he says. But when you come, he says, he would, he would take your burden from you. That, what, that which used to be so heavy, so difficult, because you had to do it all on your own. He says, it's going to feel like easy. It's going to feel light. Jesus is going to take your yoke. He's going to give you his yoke. He's going to give you a way of working that's going to that's gonna be able to sustain you, right? Notice Jesus doesn't say, come to me, give me your burdens, and I'll take care of everything for you. If you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you know that that's not true, right? You know that when you come to believe in Jesus, when you come to follow Jesus, sometimes life gets even more difficult. Jesus doesn't promise that you won't have burdens. Jesus doesn't promise that you won't have to work hard. One thing that Jesus does promise is that the work that you are given, it's going to feel light. That it's not just going to feel like a chore. That the things that God has called you to build, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be strenuous, it's going to be inconvenient, but it's going to be so worth your while, right? If you've served God faithfully, if you've served God wholeheartedly for any period of your life, you would come to know that the reward of serving Jesus outweighs the, the sacrifices of, of, of serving Jesus, right? The reward of serving God far outweighs the inconveniences and the sacrifice that it requ is required to follow Jesus. To follow Jesus, you must carry your cross. But to follow Jesus, you receive Jesus who helps you carry that cross. He carried the cross that you and I, we could not carry. Jesus, he lived the life that you and I, we could not live. And Jesus, because of his life and his death on the cross, and when he rose again from the dead, because he is alive, he invites you to also die. And you don't have to be afraid of death, right? He invites you to live with him. And when you live with him, you have a life that is burden-free, meaning a, a burden that is light, not burden-free. You, you live a life where your burdens are light, where your burdens are easy, where everything that you do actually has a lasting impact. There are many things that we do every single day, week after week. We do, we do many things that, call, that, that, is very, um, that is very stressful, right? There are many things that we do that takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of our effort. It takes a lot of energy. A lot of things that are, that are meaningful, like raising your kids, like um, spending time with your family. But there's also a lot of things that we do that really don't have a lot of meaning, if we're to be honest, right? I know that I waste a lot of my time throughout my week doing things that won't last. But God is inviting you today to invest your time, to invest your money, to invest your resources into something that will last. If you're here today, the invitation is simple, right? For those who have not yet invested into the kingdom of God, for those who have, not, who have only been burdened to build your own kingdom, the first invitation is to come to Jesus. To give your life to Jesus and trust that because of his life, because of his love, when you encounter Jesus the way that the Apostle Paul encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus, when you encounter Jesus the way that Nehemiah encountered Jesus, when I encountered Jesus eight years ago, all of a sudden it seems like the things that used to matter to me suddenly didn't matter so much anymore. I used to be so concerned about what people thought. I used to be so concerned about uh, my money. I used to be so concerned about, you know, the things that I have. But now it seems like those things don't really matter anymore because the things that matter is Jesus. The one thing that matters is 
my love for Jesus and Jesus' love for me. And that is so satisfying more than anything else in my life. Even when everything else is taken from me, the one thing that cannot be taken from me is my love with Jesus. Your love with Jesus. That's the one thing that's going to last. And the thing, your love that flows to others, that's going to last for an eternity. Church, are you investing your time, your money, your, your energy, your skills, your talents? Are you investing it into things that can, that's going to reap a reward? Are you going to do things in such a way to where when the master returns, that he's going to actually receive a double portion of what he's invested, what he's deposited to you? Have you been a good steward of the things that God has entrusted to you today? The invitation today is to follow the lifestyle of Jesus. Jesus, he had no benefit of coming down to earth. Just as Nehemiah, he didn't have anything to gain. He had everything to lose. To, he was living comfortably. Nehemiah, he was serving. He was doing well for himself. And yet he abandoned. He left all that. He put his neck on the line. He actually confronted. He asked the Persian king to actually uh, leave his role as a cupbearer to go and like essentially build uh, a nation that's considered an enemy nation to the Persians, right? And yet he was willing to do that because he loved God and he loved God's people. Jesus is the greater Nehemiah. Jesus was willing to leave his place on high. Jesus was willing to leave the throne of God. He became man, and he actually took the cross, and he do, endured even death itself. He rose again from the dead, and he invites you to follow in his footsteps, to build something that's going to last an eternity. Jesus came to um, proclaim and to in inaugurate the kingdom of God, right? When Jesus came, the first thing he said was, uh, repent for the kingdom of God is here. Jesus came to build the kingdom of God. And when Jesus left, he gives us the keys to the kingdom. When Jesus leaves, he says to his disciples, the things that I do, I now entrust to you, right? As the Father has called me, so I now call you. As the Father sent me, now I send you. Jesus says, you are going to continue to do the things that I have done. You are going to continue to build the kingdom of God if you love me. And so church, do you love Jesus? Do you want to build a, the kingdom of God, the thing that's going to last for eternity? That's what God wants for us today. Church, I want to just invite you to just stand up. If today you want to build a kingdom, if today you want to no longer just do things that are going to be here one day and be gone the next, I want you to stand with me today. Right? The keys to the kingdom. Let us uh, receive the invitation to Build God's kingdom moving from this day forward. Amen. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you, Father. We thank you, Jesus, for what you have done for us. That Jesus, as Nehemiah, has left his place of comfort and convenience to build God your kingdom so that he can invite others into the kingdom. Jesus, you too have a kingdom in our midst. That Jesus, we, we believe that the kingdom of God is here. And God, we want to enter into it. And so, Father, I pray right now that for those who are not yet in the kingdom, those who have not yet seen, who have tasted and seen the goodness of God, the love of God, the faithfulness of God, if you have not yet encountered the risen Jesus, if you have not yet seen the beauty of the kingdom of God, I pray right now that, Father, you would just give them eyes to see now. God, I pray right now that they would receive Jesus, you as the king of their kingdom that they would receive you as king, that they would enter into your kingdom to serve you, to build and to do their part, God. And our generation, we're going to do our part. And Allah, they're going to do their part. And the youth, they're going to do their part. And the children, they're going to do their part. And God, you're going to receive all the glory. And God, we're going to reap and re the, uh, receive the reward that you are uh, preparing for us in heaven, both on, here on earth and in heaven. So Father, we thank you for being a God who invites us to build with you. God, we want to build. We want to rebuild. God, would you do that with us? Would you give us the, the grace? Would you give us the wisdom? Would you help us discern right now where it is that you are calling us to serve, where it is right now that you are calling us to build? God, will we not take your word lightly? Will we not take this as a suggestion, 
But God, will we be obedient children? Will we uh, demonstrate our love for you in response to your love for us? But would we be willing to obey you at your command and to serve you no matter the cost? Jesus, we love you. We thank you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. One uh, bunch of folks come on Sunday. And uh, we will see you guys next week.